Imagine you're in the backcountry of Yosemite National Park. It's a place known for its grand rocky cliffs with the occasional waterfall spilling over its edges. And when the sun sets, it's a view unlike any other. But then, upon emerging out of this wilderness, a new kind of spectacle takes place. Suddenly, you are surrounded by hundreds of people in Yosemite Valley. A jarring amount of tourists are crowding in, and more are probably still looking for a parking spot. That's kind of what happened to recreation ecologist Dr. Ashley D'Antonio. All I remember thinking, and I had never actually been to like Disney World or Disneyland, but I entered the valley and I was like, this is not what I thought a national park was like. This feels like an amusement park to me. It's an experience that is shaping more and more of our national parks today. In 2016, the National Park Service saw peak visitation numbers, with arrivals toppling over 330 million people to its various parks, monuments, recreation areas, and other sites within the service. It's an astronomical number, and while overcrowding in our parks has been a concern for years, the last decade saw an unprecedented spike in visitation making it more difficult for the National Park Service to fulfill its dual mission of preserving these places while also making them accessible to everybody. The National Park Service was established in 1916, and that year, Yosemite National Park welcomed just over 30,000 people. A hundred years later, over five million people would enter its gates during 2016. Today, there are 419 sites under the National Park Service. Of those, 62 are designated as official national parks. While the parks absolutely need people to survive, they may be experiencing too much of a good thing. How did this idea that was meant to bring solitude, peace, and nature to all people become the new theme park of America with long lines that rival Disneyland? We've seen this happen before. In the 19th century, the crown jewel of North America was the thundering waterfall that straddled the U.S.-Canadian border, Niagara Falls. Alexis de Tocqueville, a French diplomat and author, visited the falls in 1831. He wrote of their spellbinding beauty, but he also wrote this in a letter to a friend. If you wish to see this place in its grandeur, hasten. If you delay, your Niagara will have been spoiled for you. Already, the forest roundabout is being cleared. I don't give the Americans 10 years to establish a saw or flour mill at the base of the cataract. Hucksters and swindlers meandered around the falls as an increasing number of tourists came to visit. As the falls became busier, private developers began purchasing the best overlooks, requiring tourists to pay to use them. While half of the falls belonged to Canada, it was the U.S. that many Europeans condemned for the commercialization of Niagara, quickly turning Niagara Falls into the shame of America. Yet these early failures at Niagara do have a silver lining. At least in part, the embarrassment that was Niagara Falls led to the founding of the first national park in 1872, Yellowstone. The exponential depletion of America's beauty and game for the generation of conservationists. John Muir was an influential writer who has been dubbed the father of national parks. He wrote about the need to create spaces for environmental preservation. He even took President Teddy Roosevelt, a leader closely associated with the National Parks Movement, on a camping trip to Yosemite. By 1916, President Woodrow Wilson had signed the act that created the National Park Service. This created an agency under which all national parks, monuments, and historical sites could be managed. This prevented commercialization and aimed to preserve the land while also making it available to everyone. We have this idea that our natural resources in the United States and our national parks, they're like these treasures that we have and they're unique to our country potentially. You know, we don't have these historic churches and cathedrals that European countries have, but we have these vast open spaces that we decided to protect. And I think that John Muir and folks and Teddy Roosevelt maybe had never realized how many people would come to love these places. 
The next 40 years after 1916 saw a rapidly growing population in the United States. With that, it also saw an expansion of the road system that connected more and more people to nature and national parks. When World War II hit, the parks saw a slump in attendance. This was partially due to some parks being used as training grounds and respite centers for the troops. But in the years after the war, the park saw a boom in visitation that completely overwhelmed the system. From 1945 to 1955, visits to National Park Service sites increased from just over 10 million visits to close to 50 million, a 350% increase, the highest it had ever been at the time. Much of the maintenance needed to cater to crowds of that size had been neglected during the war years. In 1955, Charles Stevenson wrote in Reader's Digest, your trip is likely to be fraught with discomfort, disappointment, even danger. He went on to describe his experience at Yellowstone. The moment you enter, you are in a big city traffic rush. Pause to look at sites you've come thousands of miles to see and cars pile up a quarter of a mile behind you. So in 1956, a plan called Mission 66 was implemented over the next decade to improve the infrastructure needed to serve ever-increasing crowds. Visitor centers and new roads within national parks increase access to the public and improve the national park experience. Not long after the completion of Mission 66, the crowds continued to grow. And so the balance of preserving these places while also making sure that they're accessible to everybody has only become more and more off kilter over the years. Any recreation plan you're supposed to look towards the future, but you can only you can only predict so far out. And I don't think they realized how much visitation was going to increase in the 70s and 80s and into now. So I think Mission 66 was great. And part of the conversation could be like, what is our next Mission 66 going to look like? And with more parks being added over the years, that may be exactly what the Park Service needs. From 2014 to 2019, the Park Service saw a 12% increase in attendance, while the previous five-year span saw only a 2% increase. Visits to official national parks clustered into some of the most popular, parks like Great Smoky Mountains, the Grand Canyon, Rocky Mountain, Zion, and Yosemite. To put that increase in perspective, that means that close to 35 million more visitors came to sites under the National Park Service between 2014 and 2019, exceeding over 300 million visits for five years in a row. So what exactly is causing this and why now? So I think a few things lined up all at once to see the really, really rapid increase we've seen in maybe the past five years or so. You know, influencers on social media might be contributing, but it's not... It's not the one thing that's part of this bigger story about what's happening in our culture, in our society, in our economy that's, that's leading to these increases in recreation use at national parks and visitation there. A rising middle class, a strong economy, and the rise of affordable travel before 2020 easily contributed to park popularity. There were also some really successful advertising campaigns. Utah's five national parks saw an increase in visitation after the park launched the Mighty Five campaign in 2013. Five iconic parks, one epic experience. As the Salt Lake Tribune reported, a study found that three years after its launch, an average of half a million more visitors came to the parks. The year the park saw peak visitation was 2016. And that followed on the heels of the National Park Service's Find Your Park Centennial Media Blitz. Find your park. Society has also shifted towards a bigger emphasis on the importance of the outdoors for mental and physical health. There's also the very real threat of climate change. How much longer are you gonna actually gonna be able to go to Glacier to see a glacier. <laughs> so I think this idea of that our parks are threatened can make people feel some urgency to go to these places, or it could just be putting it more in the news and more in front of their face and thinking about that as a place to visit. Social media has recently been the main culprit of overcrowding in national parks, but it may just be the newest contributing factor among many. And the National Park Service is actually using this to their benefit. 
now they care about this, now they're engaged, now they may be interested in a place where maybe they weren't before. So I think it's about leveraging that access, that support into preservation. And I think if you can get people on board with that message, some of the tools that we're looking at to implement to preserve these places aren't gonna be as difficult as an ask. The parks now face a lot of challenges when it comes to overcrowding. A study found that 96% of 417 sites assessed within the Park Service are plagued by air pollution problems. One of the most polluted places was Joshua Tree National Park. And to pile on top of the excess visitation, the Park Service is hoping to chip away at the nearly $12 billion maintenance backlog. Beyond that, there's issues with just simply maintaining the physical safety of guests. Car crashes are the second leading cause of death in national parks. One person dies in a motor vehicle crash every week on National Park Service roadways, mostly in the summer months when parks see the most crowding. And that's not to mention the congestion and limited parking that cars bring to national parks as well. Visitors may also put their own safety at risk, like not taking the right precautions to hike up the popular yet narrow trail to Angel's Landing in Zion National Park. It involves hanging on for dear life to a chain in order to summit. These areas are not amusement parks, and I think the exposure that you constantly see of some of these iconic parks, there's a familiarity in that that I think some security is taken for granted. And of course, tourists continue to go off trails, feed wildlife, and break simple leave no trace rules, which means to leave the land the exact same way as you found it. All of this has an impact on the preservation of the land, as the environment risks more and more degradation every year. And so the perception is people are loving parks to death, we're trying to restrict access, we're trying to keep people from crowding our parks. That's the exact opposite. We're trying to get more people in the parks at a pace where we can sustain that visitation and that there's going to be a great visitor experience for them at the end of the day. I mean, these are public lands paid by public federal dollars. Setting a capacity limit in our parks is a complex management issue, as are a lot of the solutions that the Park Service is working on. But the challenge remains that these are public lands and they were created for access by all. And it's also why a steep increase in entrance fees was widely opposed in 2017. The next year, the Park Service announced that it would only hike up fees by five or 10 more dollars. So it is imperative that the Park Service find a solution that does not limit access. Things like issuing permits, creating a reservation system, or a lottery have been implemented in parts of different parks. To free up the roads, some parks have also implemented the use of shuttle buses. There is no silver bullet or one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to fixing overcrowding in our parks. So while the Park Service works on that, the greatest impact could come from us. So I think it needs to be not just a funding solution, not just a staffing solution, but I think that visitors to these places really need to kind of step up like, how can I go here and personally minimize my impact both to other visitors and to the natural resources? And if everyone was doing that, I think what we see happening in our national parks might be a little bit, a little bit different and might be able to handle more visitation. There are also many national parks that don't receive nearly as many visitors as places like Yellowstone does. Visiting lesser-known parks, like North Cascades, takes away the burden that some of the most popular parks face. 2020 is especially giving us a glance into what our national parks and public lands look like when no one is there. But the parks are slowly reopening, raising concerns about how to manage these crowds in a world continually being shaped by the threat of COVID-19. And going forward, the Park Service will have to adapt to coronavirus safety measures. Maybe the silver lining in all of this will be a learning experience for us and how we look at crowd, crowded areas moving forward. And certainly that's not unique to the National Park Service, but I think for us in particular, as one of the issues we are looking at right now, that be something that come out of this.
is how do we look at and or manage visitor use. Vaccine or not, it just it opens your eyes to the realization of how vulnerable some of these systems really are. More than 60 years ago, a man named Edward Abbey worked as a park ranger in what is now Arches National Park. He said, wilderness is not a luxury, but a necessity of the human spirit. National parks exist to satiate these human needs. People crowd to national parks for this same reason, yet they also exist to preserve these beautiful places. And regaining that balance matters. Thank you for watching. If you want to dig deeper into the topics we covered in this video, go ahead and check out the links below. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.